I'm, I am uh, equally excited. Um, so good morning. Good to see you guys. Good to see you online. Uh, I'm Matt Harlan. Just wanted to say hi to you at home. Uh, it's good to see you guys. And PB is actually in SoCal today, uh, preaching down in SoCal. So I have the opportunity uh, to bring the word, which I am super ecstatic about. And I believe I have a word for you amen. from the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's just do a, a really quick uh, uh, shout out to PS. The last two Sundays has been preaching Fuego. Bars. Bars. If you haven't heard those sermons, uh, one, the gift of mourning she preached two weeks ago, and then two, preaching the gospel to all parts of yourself. They are really good. Amen. you got to go and dial it up. And actually, it provides a good segue to what we're going to be talking about today and also what PB is going to be talking about next Sunday. He has a sermon series titled Crossing Over. Who wants to cross over? I want to cross over. I want, you know, the chicken crossed the road, right? Maybe the listener got hit, so I want to cross over. Anyway, I'm really excited. So uh, I just want to start off with a question. How many of you guys have ever been disappointed by something that you've seen with your eyes? Raise your hand. Yeah. That should be everyone. Let's just be honest, right? We've all been disappointed, yeah. right? Some of us, the Lord has promised you're going to have a child. And you look at your life and you say, I don't have a child right now. I ain't no children running around right here, you know? Some of you guys, the Lord has promised you're going to have a spouse, right? You're going to get married. And but you're like, Lord, I'm as single as a dollar bill looking for some change. You know, ain't nobody out here, you know, around these parts. And I, I can I can attest to that. Right. Um, but in that place, I call it the place of um, there's a place of, of great desperation where I, I believe God wants to meet us. Yeah. And I believe God actually has a purpose in that season where we sit in between the promise of God's capability yeah. and our capability. And so my sermon this morning is titled Eyes of Faith. Say Eyes of Faith. I Eyes of faith. Okay, well, let's pray real quick before I get started. Jesus, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to preach your word. God, we just ask, Lord, I just uh, pray in agreement with uh, P.S. and Pastor Chenway. Awaken our hearts this morning, God. God, I pray that words would not fall on deaf ears, but Lord, I thank you that the soil is tilled, that the ground is ready to receive the word. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you've already prepared our hearts for what's getting be, being ready to be poured out this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So I'm going to be preaching from uh, John 4 this morning. You don't have to go there. We're going to put it on the screen. But what I'm talking about this morning is something I call the beautiful tension. Right. It's in between the promise. God, you've spoken these things to me. God, you've 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 uh, uh, reminded me of these things, but I haven't yet seen it. And what I want to do this morning, by the grace of the Lord, is show us how we can preserve within that tension. Right. And I believe an opportunity is thankfulness. Thankfulness is what keeps us within the tension between where God wants to take us and where we are today. Amen. 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 All right. So let's pick up the story in John 4. I'm going to read a bit of it. Uh, this mic is, a, is kind of hot up here if we can turn it down. Uh, so in John 4, Jesus is leaving Judea, going to Galilee. Say Galilee. 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 And so at the time when Jesus is going to Galilee, uh, the Jews would oftentimes not go through Samaria, which was the quickest way to go to Galilee. Yeah. Say ghetto. ghetto. Samaria was the ghetto. And the Jews did not want to go to the ghetto. So what they would often do is they would go up to the Jordan River and take a significantly longer, longer route to get to Galilee. Wow. But Jesus decides to go through Samaria for a reason, right? A couple of reasons why he decided to go. One, um, there were things escalating with the Pharisees. They were hearing that, that his disciples were baptizing. And they're like, man, we got to get this Jesus guy, right? And Jesus knew it wasn't his time. So he decides, you know what, let me go to Galilee. There's still work for me to do there. And so Jesus is going to Galilee. He's going through the ghetto, and he encounters a Samaritan woman at a well, which is significant, right? He goes to this place that Jews don't want to go. The reason why Jews didn't want to go to Samaria is because the Samaritans, they were half caste. They were both half Jewish and half Gentile. And actually, the Jews hated the Samaritans more then they even hated the Gentiles. They're like, we don't want nothing to do with them. We don't want to be seen around them. But Jesus goes, and even more remarkably, he encounters this woman, which was breaking a lot of cultural norms at the time. And so Jesus is at this well, and let's pick up the story. Um, so he comes to a city called Sychar, uh, which is where J Jacob's well was established, and our Savior becomes tired. Say tired. 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 Jesus was tired. <laughs> Can we pause on that for a moment? The Savior of the world was tired yeah. and needed to rest. Yeah. That tells us something. That tells us that Jesus is not only an advocate for us, but he's also a friend. Yeah. He can acquaint himself 
with even the things that you and I feel. He feels tired. Yeah. So he sits down at this well. He's like, man, I need, I need a little something to drink. Can somebody help me out? So he's at this well, and we're going to pick up the story in verse 9. He asks a Samaritan woman for a drink. It says this. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? She knows the cultural history, right? She knows that your boys don't come around these parts over here. <laughs> and in verse 10, Jesus says this. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Wow. This is interesting. Huh. Jesus always makes questions interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. He asked her for water. Huh. And then in, in turn, he says, actually, you should be asking me for something. Yeah. If you knew who I was and what was standing before you, yeah. I would give you something that far greater satisfies your yeah, thirst yeah, yeah. more than this water that you have. Isn't that amazing? Amen. The point I want to make here is, number one, Jesus will use places of deep pain and unfulfilled promises and broken history to show us just how good he is. Because he's acquainted himself with our suffering, we can share a cup with him. This story is so significant for a couple of reasons. One, Jesus didn't say, go get me a different cup for me to have some water. He said, let me use your cup. I want to share your suffering. And secondly, an interesting thing is, as we wait for God's promise in between our Judea and Galilee, God will often call us to go to a Samaria, yeah. right? Sometimes it's in the valley God may call us to go to before we actually reach the promise. Yeah. Right. Sometimes God may put his arm around you and take you to a valley of dry bones and say, look out here. Yeah. You see that army out there? Right. Sometimes God may take his arm and wrap it around a church community and say, we're going to go to El Cerrito. Does that sound for is, can anyone relate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sometimes God may wrap his arm around someone who's barren, who the doctor said you won't have any children and say you're going to conceive a child. Right. Sometimes God may wrap his arm around someone who has had poverty in their family, financial destruction and say, you're going to be a financer of the kingdom. Does that sound familiar to anyone? God will do that. It's often in the place of our deepest pain that God will use to turn it around to be one of our deepest victories. Right. And when we look at this story with the Samaritan woman, the interesting thing was um, they're talking about water. Right. But now. We're going to pick the story up a little bit. Uh, the story continues, and Jesus, Jesus is having this exchange with the Samaritan woman, right? And so now she's all in. She's like, I, I want some of this living water. Tell me more about this. Like, I don't want to keep coming back here in the heat of the day at 12 noon to continue to draw water. It's hot, Jesus. I'm in pain. I got things to do, right? But Jesus says, I have something better, and that's living water. Yeah. So they're talking, and then she says, Jesus, I want this. And he says, yeah. I bet. Cool. And uh, he says this. He says, call your husband. Yeah. And she says, Jesus, I have no husband. He says, ah, yeah, you're right. You have five. You got five husbands. <laughs> and she says, I think you're a prophet. <laughs> and, uh, and then they start go having this theological debate, right? So yeah. now she's talking about, well, you know, we said we're going to worship on this mountain. You Jews say that we're going to worship in Jerusalem. And now she's a theologian, right? She's irate. She's talking to Jesus. <laughs> and so they're going back and forth. Yeah. And in this exchange, it's very interesting. Um, in verse 25, we'll pick it up. It says this. Uh, she says, I know that Messiah, he who is called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain all to us. So basically, you're a prophet. That's cool. I hear what you're saying. But when the real Messiah comes, he'll tell me what I really need to know. And verse 26 says this. It says, Jesus declared to her, and this is what I call a thug scripture. This is the drop the mic scripture. He says this. He says, I, the one who am speaking to you, I am he. Interesting fact about this. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that Jesus drank the water or that she drank the water. I was looking for that, man. I'm like, yo, what happened to this water that we were talking about? That's, isn't the whole verse about them drinking water from the well? But the crazy thing is, she ends up leaving, at the very mention of hearing this from Jesus, she ends up leaving her water at the well, wow. running back to her town people and saying, come and see of this man that has told me all manner of things about myself. See, whenever Jesus activates us, whenever we get a word, he turns mourning into joy. Amen. Can anyone relate to that? 
So she was in a place of mourning. I need water. I'm tired of coming here. How many of you can relate to that? God, I'm tired of continuing to pray for the same promise over and over again. God, I'm tired of coming to church. We just had COVID, racism. Everything's happening outside. My Lord, budget deficit. We don't know what's going on. God, I'm tired. But Lord, you've given me a promise, right? How many of you have been in that place of that tension? Am I, am I preaching to anyone this morning, right? But oftentimes, whenever we get the revelation, we hear the word of the Lord, it quickens our spirit, and we start to see differently. Let me tell you something. You can see things with your eyes, and you can also see things with your spirit. Two things can coexist, right? One thing can coexist is, I need water. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. And then the second thing is, my goodness, I've just encountered living water, the Messiah. And what happens is, once we start to awaken and our faith to what Jesus is trying to do in us, we end up forgetting the very thing that caused us pain to to begin with. I'll give you a natural example of that. Who's pregnant in this house? We got like 20 people pregnant, right? All y'all, everybody's pregnant, Lord Jesus. We're gonna have to beef up the kids' church ministry. But in pregnancy, my wife is pregnant too. You know, it's painful. There are some days we like, hey, do you you really wanna do this? I don't know. (laughs) We can't go back now, you know, like, a baby's coming. And it's painful. There's morning sickness, and there's cravings. Your emotions are running on a roller coaster, and it's like, my Lord Jesus, how much time we got? Because I'm ready for this thing to be here. Can I get an amen, fellas? Where y'all at? I know all that. There we go. Praise the Lord, Matt. And, uh, but the interesting thing is, at the delivery room, when the woman is getting ready to have the baby, yeah. and that baby comes, yeah. and the baby comes out, she doesn't say, oh, that was so much pain. You know what? She's joyful. Yeah. Why? Because the promise is there. Yeah. There's no need to mourn anymore. Yeah. And so what I want to tell you wow. this morning is wow. there is a harvest coming. Wow. Many of us have mourned over what has happened in the state of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord, COVID has, has hurt the numbers. Yes, true. Oh, Lord, there's empty seats. Yes, true. But God has a word for us in El Cerrito that he has prepared and planted a harvest for us to participate in. This is, this is crazy. In 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says this. It says, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth, looking for those that he might entrust himself into. Wow. Do you remember when Jesus was on the cross at Calvary? What did he say with, about the cup? Anybody, anybody remember? He says, Lord, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. Yeah. He said, I've been, you know, we've done all the things. This is great. This is the final stop. I'm good. This is enough. (laughs) Take it. Even the Savior, right? But what did God do? He allowed him to endure it. Why did God do that? He could have just zapped it away. He could have just said, Jesus, you did a good job. You fought the good fight. All right, cool. You don't have to die. We're done. We're good, right? I got the point across. But instead, he allowed the Savior of the world to undergo all the wrath of dependence of our sin on him. The reason why he did that is so that in Jesus we can know, you and I, that as we're in this tension waiting for God, waiting on the promise, that we have an advocate in him, right? In the same way that he endured with the Father, the cup of wrath is in the same way. He wants to share the cup of your pain and affliction with you. See, a lot of times whenever we're in this tension of waiting for God to do something, we feel that now we need to retreat and go back in the closet and we need to drink a little cup of water by ourselves. All right, Lord, help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. (laughs) Right? And he comes and you know what he says? He says, give me a drink. Let me get some of that. I want to do it with you. I want to partner with you. But the thing, this is the key here. If If we don't have eyes of faith, we won't be able to perceive God's presence in our time of need. If we just have eyes in the natural, what does that tell us? Oh, Lord, it's hard. Oh, God, I'm thirsty. My skin's getting a little darker out here. The sun is lit, right? But what does the eyes of the faith tell us? Jesus is here. He is the Messiah. And not only that, but he wants to share in the cup with you and I. Amen? Amen. So I want to say is it's harvest season. That's the word from the Lord. Naturalized will have us seeing the distance between our ability and what God wants to do and desire to do do through our lives, right? It'll have us saying the giants are big in the land. 
And another thing I want to say is that night doesn't last forever. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that when we go through pain, we end up believing this fallacy that somehow it's going to be ongoing yeah. for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever experienced that? Lord, my marriage is hard. My goodness, she ain't going to change, <laughs> right? He ain't going to change. He's the yeah. same. He's never going to change. Yeah. But eyes of faith will have you still in the present reality, but you'll be able to perceive and see as God sees. Amen. So then you're able to call forth the destiny of the person that you're dealing with. And what I call that, that's harvest. That's harvest season, right? You're able to see the fruit. This is where you are today, but I promise you, this is not where God is taking you, right? Right now, you may be undergoing trauma. Right now, you may be undergoing shame, but there is mourning coming, right? There's a promise coming. There's a birth coming. This baby is not going to stay inside of you forever. Yeah. It's coming out. There's going to be a, a matriculation process that happens. You're going to mature. You're going to get through this. See, I'm yeah. going to get through this. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Can we pick up the story? Yeah. All right. So the disciples are back now. They actually had went to go get some food, right? How convenient. Jesus goes through the ghetto, and the disciples are like, all right, hey, Jesus, we're going to go to that chicken place down the street. We'll see you in a little bit. You do your thing. Do your hood excursion. We'll be back. And so they're back. Hello, disciples. How was the chicken? And they're begging Jesus to eat. They're saying, Jesus, eat. You must, you're, you're thirsty. You're hungry. Now they're realizing the need, right? He, he came and he sat down and they went to go eat. And now they're, it's just kind of funny. Now they're asking him to eat. So they're saying, Jesus, eat. And they look at one another because no one brought Jesus food. How funny is that, right? Y'all homeboys, leave the Savior to go through the ghetto, y'all go eat, and now y'all don't bring Jesus back any food. My goodness. There's a word in that somewhere, but we're, we got to keep going. So they were too preoccupied by filling their need. They did not consider the need of the Savior. Um, and in verse, verse 35, it says this. You know, they, so Jesus says, my will is to do the will of the Father. And this is the text that I really want to focus on uh, for this sermon. In verse 35, it says this. Do not say they are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Jesus is saying, don't tell me what is to come. He's saying the time is now, wow. right? Don't tell me it's long, it's long down the road. It's actually here right now. And see, this is the thing I want to get across to you with Jesus, right? And with us being Christians and with us receiving him and him living on the side inside of us is we already have the promise within us. Yeah. We have everything. You have everything you need to get between your Judea and your Galilee. Yeah. You have everything you need inside of you to traverse through the pain yeah. and the agony of waiting right. because Jesus has already done it on your behalf. Yeah. Can we rejoice in that? Yeah. Amen. So here's the premise. How we see things with our eyes dictate our ability to be aware of God's presence. Wow. If you see something die in yourself, I want you to say, God is just preparing me for harvest. Yeah. It's coming. And the word I really want to drive home is Jesus is the now. He is the definition of prophecy, meaning it says that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That child that God has promised you is already here. It's done. It's finished. The same way in, on the cross when Jesus said it is finished before the resurrection, he was declaring it's already complete. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. The corporate word for, for this season is God has a harvest for us in El Cerrito, and that harvest is now. Mm -hmm. The individual word for you in this season is God is not finished with you yet, mm -hmm. but he's actually faithful to complete everything in your life that he's spoken over you yeah. until the coming of Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Do you know that there are a cloud of witnesses that have gone before you? Yeah. Do you know that your life is a living testimony yeah. that people are waiting to read? Do you know scripture says that you are epistles, which means you are stories? Yeah. Do you know that it says that creation groans and waits for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed? Yeah. God is, is developing a story with your life. See, a lot of times we get upset at God yeah. because we're like, God, it's not done yet. God, where's the water, yeah. right? When God is trying to show us something deeper, yeah. he's saying, I am the harvest, yeah. right? In Proverbs, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yeah. But in 1 Colossians, it says that Jesus is the hope of glory, which is inside of us. Wow. That's the mystery, is that we already have it in us. Sometimes yeah. it just takes time for us to say, wake up. Yeah. Say, wake up, faith. Wake up, wake up faith. 
Sometimes we just need to awaken that bad boy asleep on the inside. Eyes are closed. You know what I mean? <laughs> Is this good? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So I want to say this. You know, the gladness and sufficiency and the pleasure of God rest inside of you. Yeah. And so I think this morning we need to make some decisions, huh. right? Yeah. Those two things exist, right? We can see with our eyes and see what's happening in the world. We can see the distance between where we are today and where God wants to take us. We can see the distance between Judea and Galilee, but also in our faith, right, inside of us with eyes of faith, God has a journey that he wants to traverse with us. God has a cup that he wants to share with us. And so really now the determination is how do we see with those eyes? How do we open up our eyes of faith that we can actually see and perceive what God is doing? You know what the key is? Say thankfulness. And remembrance. Remember when Jesus was sitting with the disciples before he was telling what was going to happen? He was going to depart. He said, I'm going to depart. I'm going to be with you no more. He said, do this in what of me? Remembrance of me. Why? Because as we remember our Savior, who, ha- who we have an advocate in, who, we can, who, who has been through all manner, of sin, all manner of shame, all manner of pain that we have been through, we have someone that we can say, there's hope. There's hope here. Right? There's hope in Christ, and it's not displaced. And if we put our hope in Christ, our hope is secured. Say secured. Secured. He has you this morning. Amen. 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 And in John 16, 20, it says this. It says, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, yeah. she forgets her anguish wow. and she receives the child in joy because it's yeah. coming to the world. Amen. You know, as I was preparing um, for this sermon, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I was tired this week. Yeah. I was tired. I remember going to sleep on Wednesday and I was like, Lord, life feels hard right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was like, I just don't I don't know if, if is it the time change. Me and my mom were talking about is it the time. What's going on? Is it the weather change? Like, I just feel tired. Yeah. And I remember praying and I was like, Lord, can you give me strength? And I heard this. He said, will you wait on me? Wow. Will you wait on me? Wow. And I was like, Lord, not really. I want to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but what I felt like the Lord was saying was, will you allow me to bring forth the harvest in your life? Wow. Right. Will you not disconnect wow. from me? Wow. Will you stay connected? Will you stay believing in faith? Yeah. Right. And I feel like the word for you this morning is, will you wait on the Lord? Wow. Right? Some of you guys have promises from 2016 and 2013, things yeah. that God has spoken over yeah. you. Yeah. But I feel like there's three groups of people in this room today huh. and on, online. I feel like the first group are, the, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. Wow. Like, God, yeah, you know, I know you've spoken this promise. The harvest is coming. I know you've spoken in my life. You're going to use me to touch the nations. And when you start doing it, then I'll start to believe. Wow. Right. And my counsel to you this morning is see it and believe it. It's okay, but see it and believe it. Start now. God wants to do it in you now. There's a second group in in this room, and I feel like it's group. It's the group that has sunglasses on. And what that means is you have been so overly sensitized with the word of God that it's actually more easier for you to dull your senses than to actually be in a place of faith. And so you put on sunglasses because you're like, it's just too hard. I've been there again and again and again. And I've heard people prophesy over me again and again and again. And I've heard it, but I don't see it. So I'd much rather just close my eyes to it because it's too painful to sit within that reality. My counsel to you this morning is believe it. He's not done with you yet. You're still here. He said in Philippians, his word is that he is faithful unto the coming of Christ Jesus to do it in you. And then there's a third group of people. I feel they're in this room. And the third group is your near sight vision is excellent. I mean, when it gets into focus, you believe. You're like, yeah, Jesus is going to do it. Come on. Yeah, I see it. It's coming. The date is approaching. I'm going to El Cerrito. It's tomorrow. I see it. All right, I'm starting to see the furniture in the church. Now I'm starting to come to, to faith and I believe it, right? But then once it gets past your depth of field and your capacity 
it becomes too big for your capacity, and it seems yet too far for you to understand, you start to get confused a bit. And you get in this place where you know, it's almost agnostic. We're like, I'll believe if it happens, but if it doesn't, I'm OK. Yeah. Right? And I, and I would say, don't, don't feel bad, but my counsel to you this morning is believe it. And the interesting thing is, I've been in all three of these places yeah. this week. <laughs> I'm tired, y'all. I've been in all three this week. And I was praying, and I, and I felt like the Lord was saying, is, I am not done with you yet. There is a season of harvest. The morning is coming, right? The world, you can see dry bones. That's okay. It's okay to see the dry bones, right? But at the same time, understand that God is going to birth an army from the dry bones, right? It's okay to be in the boat and you see the storm. But at the same time, Jesus called you to be on the water. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to walk. I'm walking on, something's going to happen, right? A flotation device is going to come out. Jesus is going to do it. Right. And so what I want to encourage you this morning is the harvest is now. Say the harvest is now. The harvest is here. Amen. Amen. So I want to I want to pray for us um, really quick. Uh, Jesus, I just thank you, um, God, for your word this morning. God, I thank you that you do not leave us alone. Um, God, I thank you, God, that your word says that if you've put it within us, you were faithful to complete it with us. And God, I thank you that you even seek to do it through us, Lord, that you don't seek to just have your will done, but you want to partner with your body. And so, Lord, I just thank you, Father, that sometimes we can be so discouraged by where we are and the words that you've given us, the distance between those things. But, Lord, I believe this morning that you are healing hearts. I believe this morning, Jesus, that you are opening eyes of faith to believe you again. God, I believe this morning that there are people that have doubted you for years. They've been so desensitized with hearing words and prophecies and promises. But I believe this morning, Lord God, that you are taking off callous off their eyes this morning, Jesus. God, I also believe this morning that you're reawakening and reengaging us in a place of faith. I believe that there's people this morning that say, I haven't had faith for two years. COVID happened and my faith went on the shelf. But I believe the Lord is saying this morning, have faith again. Yeah. See it and I will do it. I am he. Amen. I am the Messiah. Yeah. And so, Jesus, we just want to thank you this morning, God. God, we just agree with that prayer this morning. We say, awaken us, Lord. Awaken us, Lord God. God, awaken us, Lord God, that we would be like the woman at the well and that we would even forget the very thing that caused this pain and mourning. But, Lord, that we would be excited, quickened yeah. to take your word wherever you may have us travel. Amen. Amen. And so, Jesus, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.